Harsanyi time, everybody. Our friend back from a, a short stint of book writing. So we haven't had him on in the new year yet. Our friend David Harsanyi back in the mix here. He is a senior writer at National Review, and he's going to have a great book to talk about at some point soon. But for right now, it's still getting written. David, great to have you. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. All right, man, we haven't had you weigh in on just the state of things right now. What what is what is top of mind for you in the political scene as we as we talk today? Uh, um, well, I, I am very concerned about uh, just generally free speech issues. So for me, I am, you know, concerned about how Twitter and Google and Amazon are acting just in general. So that's a big topic for me. Obviously, I, I am uh, concerned for the country in general when you look at the anger and the violence that was generated last week um, over the election, which I, you know, which I think was pretty horrible and uh, perpetuated by a mythology that the entire election was stolen. And uh, so the, I guess those are the two big things. And, and then, you know, we haven't even really been able to really sort of get our minds around, at least I haven't, you know, what the what a Biden administration means for us on a, on a number of issues. But I think obviously we'll have enough time for that. Let's let's take some of these one by one. Let's let's start with the free speech issue. I've been talking a lot on the show about what it means for big tech censorship. And I do think that that particularly among conservatives on on the right there, there is a, you know, people say, oh, does it really matter? You know, Twitter does this or Facebook does that. Does it really matter now? And that, that had been the attitude. You know, people that work in media, we care a lot about it because it affects our ability to speak to our, our readers and listeners. But I think the general public is getting an understanding now. No, this is this is the entire Internet architecture that is being used to silence. This is if your business is selling products of any kind that, you know, it, who knows? I mean, you might be selling MAGA hats and all of a sudden Amazon decides uh, you're shut down and not just we won't sell your stuff. We'll take your website off the Internet. Right. Or credit card companies say we're not going to sell, you know, we're not, you can't use us to buy, you know, guns or, or whatever it is. So it's very problematic. I, I struggle with it because I'm a big believer in, in the free market and a big believer in, in people being able to make choices in that market on their own. I do find it funny that the same people who are pro individual mandate in Obamacare and want to force you to buy health insurance, who want to sue nuns to buy condoms, who want to, uh, you know, involve themselves in essentially everything that's done by the, um, by the free market. Sorry, that's my dog barking. Um, it's okay. It's the world we're in now. We got to do hits from home. You get a dog. I love, you know, I love dogs, so I got no problem. Go ahead, David. So in any event, so I find it funny that they pretend to care about, you know, these choices, which I think they're just happy to be able to shut people up who they disagree with. So in my contention on this and my argument is, listen, there's a value behind the First Amendment and free expression. It's not just about the right. If Even if the right wasn't codified, even if it wasn't written down, we would still believe in the ideals of it. So when you're just so happy to shut down millions of people because they're saying something that you don't like, and I don't even like most of the time, I think that that's in a liberal attitude. And when that becomes normalized as it is now, this is even beyond like sort of the practical parts of it. When you chip away at that and people feel like it's fine to shut down millions of voices that they don't agree with, I think that bodes very poorly for the First Amendment moving forward as well. well and I'll just use this as an example. The term, and because I've been speaking about this really for, for all of Trump's presidency, the term white supremacy. I mean, I remember there was that Edward Norton movie, American History X, which I never actually really, I saw pieces of it here and there on HBO and such, but you know, there, there are movies uh, or, or, you know, when people talked about white supremacists in the 90s, the early 2000s, it, immediately, you know, you had this image of a, a very bad person who was, of course, a, a racist, but also an anti-Semite and, you know, neo-Nazi, white supremacist, shaved head, swastika tattoo guys. You know, th this was what you would see in your mind with white supremacy. And everyone agreed these are bad guys. The term white supremacy now is used routinely by the left for, you know, I mean, if, if you oppose, if you support the Asian American 
uh, uh, guy who sued Harvard for discriminating against people say, well, this is this is perpetuating white supremacy. It's like the term white. Su- so I, I bring this up just because I feel like everyone needs to understand well, e- even if they are saying they're only going to go after bad people uh, for for sa- for wrong think online or for for evil thing that is abs- they're going to they're going to expand this. So that they'll go after people who just oppose an idea and is com- and it's a completely legitimate opposition. Yeah, I mean, you make a very good point. People <clears throat> who want to shut down a bad voice, and we say, if we give in and say, "Hey, yeah, you know, if we if we treat free speech as not a neutral value, but just simply something that protects good speech," that never ends. As you mentioned, everyone's a white supremacist, right? I mean, anyone who, who's you know behind a tax cut is a white supremacist because it's unfair or whatever it is. It's funny that you mention American History X. I'm probably getting this somewhat wrong, but this that movie is a perfect example of how they do this. There's a scene where he's at the table being all Nazi-like, right? He's saying, you know, I hate black people, I hate Jews. And then all of a sudden he's like, an affirmative action is terrible, you know? Like, so they fold in things that are reasonable to disagree with into the larger, con- you know, context of hatred and stuff like that. You know, oh, you want to close the border, um, you know, the, the Nazi guy wants to close the border. So they're essentially saying anyone who wants to close the border is also a Nazi or, or they, you know, they intimate that. So, yeah, you see that a lot. Yeah, that's and that's you know, I told the- you I hadn't I hadn't seen the movie. I just I don't want to cut you off. I want you to continue your point. But I just say, I mean, so so it's even it's even apparent that tendency to take what is objectively un- and objectively clearly wrong, immoral, evil but then use that sort of universal moral revulsion to then start going after things that clearly aren't that, right? Like, like if you oppose tax cuts, but go ahead. Yeah, it's like saying, I really, you know, making a, a, a creating a fictional character as a Nazi and then saying, I'm really for, you know, uh, uh, Medicare for all. Because you know, you know, Germans had that kind of system long, you know, long before anyone. And 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 Richard Spencer, or is it Richard Spencer, or I forgot whatever the Nazi guy's name is, um, you know, is for it as well. So then you must be for it. So I mean, it's just an expansive view of these things, and it never ends. And that's why you have to worry about speech. Like, let me just say, saying the people who are getting banned are saying that the election was stolen, right? Um, I disagree with them. But that's a complete that's just a viewpoint. It's not an inciting, you know, you're not inciting violence by having that viewpoint just because some people acted violently. And you Nancy know how Pelosi why I know still that? has for, Nancy Pelosi still years. has a tweet up, David, from 2017 right. saying our election was hijacked. That's right. the same thing as saying stolen. And it's still there, there, there are there were people on CNN who essentially and on MSNBC who are no better than Lynn Wood or anyone else who had conspiracy theories that were just as bad. Now, do I want elected officials to act better than the than the talk show person? Yeah, I do. But that but but still, as far as speech goes, they were saying the same thing. I would ask any of these people, do you believe that the 2016 election was or was not stolen or if the Russians were involved? And they're still going to they'll still tell you the Russians were. So I don't understand why they get to. I mean, I do understand why they get to speak, but obviously the standard's not the same. Being a David Harsani, senior writer at National Review, and you can read his latest at nationalreview.com. David, where do you think conservatism goes now? Uh, it feels very, we, we, we're, we're uncertain. A lot of people are really worried. And there doesn't seem to be any, anything offering much in the way of, of answers about you know, what, what the movement is. What do you think happens? I, I don't know what the movement is. I mean, obviously, I have serious disagreements with many people on the right over, uh, you know, trade policy or policy with big tech. And obviously, there's going to be some big disagreements. But frankly, every, you know, people who think the Republican Party is finished or this or that, I, I think they misjudge the situation. Um, I think what's going to happen is you'll have the Biden administration doing all kinds of things that conservatives hate as a collective. And then that will unite them as it did unite the you know, the left when Trump became president. So that's typically what happens because you have big consensuses on the right and left, not a multi-party state, you know, meaning more than two that are always fighting. So I I don't know that it's going to be all, you know, rosy and and there'll be a friendship among all those folks. Um, I mean, I'm not a big fan of like Howley or or others, you know, who are more populist. But I think that in the end, you have if you have a common and I use the word not, you know, a common enemy, but I don't mean it in the in the 
war warlike sense. But if you have a common political opponent, you uh, you sort of rally around the trying to stop them. And and on on the big tech issue, uh, that's one area where people keep saying, "Okay, well, what do we do?" And I don't have a great answer other than everyone's got to understand what this really means. I, and, and, you know, the, the answer that I had been thinking of was, well, we'll build our own stuff, but you got to go a whole lot deeper now, we've seen, to build your own stuff and actually have it withstand a left-wing purge. Yeah, I used to say, you know, I get mocked for saying build your own, you know, build your own institutions, build your own platform. I still think you can. Um, I mean, Parler probably would have been somewhat successful on, on its own, even though I think I don't like the echo chamber aspect of it. But whatever, you know, it is what it is. But now you have, you know, sites purging, purging the ability of people to even have a site. And I don't know if you remember a few months ago, uh, Google ads threatened to shut down the Federalist because people were saying things in their comment section. You essentially are, are given this power to arbitrarily have rules and then pick and choose who you want to shut down. I mean, I've worked at a number of websites in my life and policing a comment section is impossible, right? There's always going to be someone saying something. So you could just pick any of them and decide you want to shut them down and for any reason. I don't know how to deal with that. I, I think giving government more power and trying to, uh, you know, empower government to decide what speech should look like or fair speech should look like. I think that's a dangerous turn as well. You see the people who are in government. I, I wouldn't I don't trust them with much. Certainly wouldn't want to trust them with uh, deciding who gets free speech and who doesn't or more speech. So I'm with you. I don't have a solution for it. Um, maybe the market well, will no, provide also, it. Explain by this to me. S section Section 230 uh, of the 1996 Communications Decency Act, whatever it is. Section 230 gives people who run these kinds of, you know, Facebook and, uh, you know, all, all these big Internet companies that, that have a platform effect where you can write comments, as you said. It means that they're not liable for that. But Parler, according to Amazon, is being taken, has been taken off their servers because of what third parties were writing on Parler. You know what I mean? So it's, it, it, that does seem highly arbitrary, doesn't it? I mean, if, you, if yeah. the whole point is that there's supposed to be this legal protection, but then Amazon says, oh, well, even though you got this legal protection, you're not doing a good enough job of moderating comments that you're not legally, you, you, you see what I mean? Yeah, they're acting like a like a shadow government almost of the internet, right? And they have these rules. Like, I think it was Twitter, but I, I'm not exactly sure. I might be wrong. That said, that you know we're shutting this down for safety reasons. Now, obviously, guarding people from speech as a matter of safety is the oldest excuse for censorship. It's as old as censorship itself. But the idea that they have some kind of uh, we've created this, we've normalized the idea that they have some sort of responsibility to keep us safe from words, right? I mean, that's a dangerous, that's a dangerous road to go down, I think. And, you know, people get mad at me. They say, like, um, at least on Twitter, you know, you care more about the speech issue than the Capitol riot, you know, the insurrection, the armed insurrection and coup and et cetera. Yeah, in, in some sense, I do. I think that that was a terrible and embarrassing moment in American history. But I don't think it has any long term effect on how we live our life, unless, of course, Biden passes some kind of domestic terrorism act or some kind of, you know, intrusive thing like that. But the speech issue that is with us now. We've created new norms that are with us now moving forward. It's, you know, the day after Trump gave them an excuse, they literally shut down half of conservative, you know, uh, interactions on social media, just like that. I mean, I've lost a lot of followers. I don't know what that's about, but um, it's clearly some kind of coordinated and concerted effort. And I also, I, I think that the the way that the, the, the drag net that they're going to be using here, so to speak, is going to take it. There's so many people who, you know, I, I remember even you know, for a while, it was like people were worried if they were looking at, you know, Al Qaeda statements to be terrorism researchers. And, and they and it turned out, yeah, some of them were getting uh, all, all of a sudden they were popping up on some radars for people that are, you know, understanding the, you know, the Arabic uh, videos that would be released by Inspire and some of these groups uh, that, that were meant to bring people to, to jihadism. I mean, so at this point, if, if you use hashtag stop the steal and you're mocking it, let's say even, are, are people to believe that your Twitter account or whatever is going to be safe? from? I don't think so. I mean, I think that they're just they're just nailing people all over the place and they don't care. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand why someone can't have the opinion that the election was stolen. It's not that. 
it's not it's not even hate speech or anything. They think the election was stolen, just as most Democrats, 67 percent of Democrats believed about 2016. So, like, I, I don't even understand. I do understand. I mean, it's just a pretext to try to shut people up and anyone, any journalist, especially, which is what they do now most of the time, who works to shut down the voices of people who is excited about shutting down people who they don't like are illiberal people. They are not believers in the First Amendment. And just because they, through a technicality, can say, uh, you know, you don't have the right to say whatever you want. You can't scream uh, fire in a theater and that kind of nonsense um, in a crowded theater. They are illiberal. It doesn't matter that it, if it's legal or not, in my opinion. I don't know if that makes sense. I just. No, it absolutely vaccine. matters. There's a culture yeah. of the First Amendment, too. It's not just about the constitutional protection uh, from government interference and the law. So I, I completely agree with you. But uh, I've been saying this and a lot of journalists got, you know, journals got mad at me. The biggest the biggest advocates these days publicly of suppression of free speech are people who make a living based on the principle of free speech, which is journalists. And I, I think that that should be noted. I mean, there, there are a lot of the biggest censors are people who work at CNN and work at The New York Times. But we've got to leave it there for today. David Harsani, everybody check out his latest at nationalreview.com. David, thanks so much. Hey, Team Buck, thank you so much for watching The First on YouTube. If you like this video, please click that little thumbs up button so then it will log as liked. And also, if you want to see more great content from The First, please click subscribe.